Uh, all of you, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining in. Prince, Sanjeev, Shri, always a pleasure to connect with all of you, right? So we, we I mean, this is pretty much the, 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 the place where we get all leaders like you come share their experiences, right? So without further ado, let me jump right in, right? Uh, I have, I have a couple of questions that uh, I'm fairly excited to speak to you about. So maybe I'll, I'll probably kickstart this conversation here with Prince. Prince, uh, I mean, I know for the, uh, I, I'm, with the risk of being repetitive, right? Because I know most of us have come through a pandemic. Hopefully we've seen the, the worst is behind us, right? Uh, but it's very fair to say that, you know, the, the pandemic for, all the negatives that it uh, got with it. One of the big outcomes that we see is it's expedited a lot of our digital transfer processes, right? In your experience, uh, and I'm not going to uh, harp too much about that because I think we've had multiple discussions around that. But what I would like to understand from your perspective is, so when we talk about digital transformation, digital transformation is a process which has been there much before the pandemic also. Ever since, I mean, I have been, uh, in this space as an analyst for almost 20 odd years, I've seen DT in some form or the other. Do you see a fundamental shift in how you look at DT in a pre-pandemic world and a post-pandemic world? It's a very, fairly straightforward question. Thanks for that question. So I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, relate from my experience because before I was with uh, Nest Group, I, I had a stint in an airline. I don't want to give names and whatnot, but we had gone through a project that was actually called a transformation project. And that okay. was way back in 2004, five, six. And we didn't use the word digital at that time, but the intent was we want to rebrand IT. We want to rebrand IT from what it was doing then and try to give it a new focus and a new impetus and a new fresh look at um, how it's going to be done plus a real thrust on processes, uh, which was missing in those days. Right now, things have changed. And right now with the inclusion of the word uh, digital, again, there is a new sort of rebranding of IT that's happening. That's what I'm seeing now. So right now, there is a focus on quite a few things, uh, which is you know, beyond going beyond an application management, infrastructure management, there used to be a lot of management things that IT used to do. Right. But now if you look at every function in, in your organization, uh, finance, uh, supply chain, marketing, you can't see that any one of them has changed as much as IT has, because IT is not the same anyway. It's just, it's just unrecognizable when it comes to management of the IT responsibility now. Right. You've got so much of, of um, and I think this is now getting to be a bit of a, um, you know, a tough time for CIOs. While it is putting them into the limelight, I think there is a, there is a, uh, that that preparation for handling that or the, the the navigation into that that is being done very quickly. That's a bit of a, a a feeling that I have because you are at the forefront of everything strategic at the moment. You are at the forefront of everything growth oriented at the moment. You are at the forefront of everything that is to do with innovation at the moment. So this is what has happened. I won't say pandemic had something to do with it or not. <laughs> it may it may not have. But the reality now is the here is a new normal. Unfortunately, the CIO now has to be um, knowledgeable about HR a little bit more than the HR guy himself so that he can go and help them. Uh, it's the same with every other function. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's become so interesting and challenging that the, uh, the rebranding of IT now requires us to do a lot of work to prepare the IT team and the structure underneath it to support this sort of demand. So this is where I see the evolution of, of IT has happened into where we have reached uh, right now. Um, the focus on everything strategic and growth related from a business perspective is now on the, um, in, the in, in the strong remit of the CIO. In earlier cases, it was about supporting a strategic program or supporting something by providing infrastructure or security elements or whatever. But now things have gone a little bit ahead where you are asked to be um, steering all this. Chris, you know what? Uh, mine was <clears throat> fairly, you know, it was like a, a typical standard gen open first question to you, but I like the way you gave a twist to this. And it, and it helps me 
uh, take my conversation forward, two things that I didn't rightly mention, uh, which which I, I haven't seen it from that perspective. A, we've always seen the IT leader or CEO like you, you know, emerge as a champion. And we've been hailing this CIO for, for the last two years for keeping everything on. But is it really an enviable spot? Because, because, because you, you're doing far too many things to also go wrong. So that's one perspective. And I love the analogy that you gave me is wherein you're at times you are supposed to know HR better than your HR specialist. And I think that because, because like you said, I mean, you don't, you don't deploy IT for the sake of deploying IT. It has to have a business use case, right? I mean, so, so I, I, I'll, I'll take this conversation ahead. Sanjeev, I'm getting you into this conversation because Prince really helps me here. When he says, you know, that, you know, as a CIO, as an IT leader, you know, I need, because like you said, you know, uh, you know what technology can do for a particular business function, but you need to know what the business requirements are. At times, the business function head may not be aware what technology can do for him or her. In such a scenario, right, have you seen certain specific changes and alterations that organizations have started requesting for in a post-pandemic so-called modern workspace environment? What has been your uh, experience around that? It was really nice hearing Prince talking about the digital uh, transformation. Mm -hmm. I would like to say from the manufacturing perspective of Krishna Group that mm -hmm. we were planning out a uh, digital charter for our organization before the pandemic in, way back in 2019 and so. Okay. So okay. we have put up a uh, chart for next three years, what all we are going to do in the digital framework uh, so that slowly and uh, steadily we went for it. And all of a sudden the pandemic hit into the things and everything changed because of that particular thing because in the starting for 10, 15 days, it was good that, okay, everybody was thinking that things are going to start up very soon. But it took long and then the, uh, we started from the IT perspective, started discussing into it, how exactly can we leverage the IT to give the business the same feel what they were doing during mm -hmm. post uh, uh, pre -pandem pandemic that they were how they were operating so we started right. working on to the with the business leaders that how exactly your problems can be resolved sitting at your home you are able to see what all things you need to do and during this pandemic period uh, where we are in lockdown you cannot do anything so we started doing a lot of digital uh, initiatives into the organization we started creating all the workflow things because a lot of paperwork was there. So we converted every paperwork into a workflow-based digital platform mm -hmm. where everything was automated into the system so that uh, people were able to test those systems during that period and were able to implement that particular thing system. And that particular really changed the environment of the organization. People who were hesitant in using the digital framework were not mm -hmm. coming forward with their needs. That mm -hmm. if you do this particular part for me, I will be able to really take the benefit in business during this period. So we converted a lot of things. We used uh, our test period for training of our uh, workforce for IT initiatives uh, related to ERPs and another part. The other basic point which came up, which was a real benefit to the organization was that we were having a lot of uh, operational technologies running in silos in the organization. We have an automated uh, production lines. We are using a lot of robots and we have to pick to place systems which were uh, running parallelly in uh, with the IT department. Mm -hmm. So during this period, we decided that, okay, let's uh, get the IT and OT uh, convergence, let the marriage happen between these two, two systems, and then start taking benefit out of it. So we started um, merging these two functions, and then we found that we were able to utilize the data which has been captured uh, using these machines like PLCs, robots, and all other machines, modeling machines. So we started capturing the data from them and we were able to create the dashboards for the management for faster decision making. We were able to show the management what is the performance of my machines, my plants, how my machine is operating, which machine is down, how is my energy consumption, how are my rejections happening, which particular machine is doing good, which machine is going to fail. So all those uh, uh, operational MISs, or I should say, the dashboards were created and shown to the organization. We started the pilot with one organization and it was so successful that the other plants uh, started coming up to us that, okay, now we want 
and the automation to be done to her. The, the most important part of it is the management was so ready to do this particular part into the organization that they wanted everything to be converted to digital. So that was uh, one thing which uh, has escalated, I would say, digital has escalated during this uh, pandemic. And post-pandemic IT department is having so many projects in hand to do, which mm -hmm. we were striving to do uh, pre-pandemic. So because we were running after the business, now the business right. is running after us to get the business. Started. Right, right. So you, you know what? Uh, I think you know what we decided to make uh, our discussion more inclusive. You know, so uh, we ran a survey. You know, with all uh, all our friends uh, from the industry who've joined in today and listening to us. You know, and we we ran a survey asking a couple of questions, and I and thought I'll share because these uh, data points that we captured. Uh, I think has relevance to what we speak. So one of the first questions that we asked, you know, uh, our friends was, you know, over the next year, you know, what are some of the key objectives for their organization in the in this era of uh, hyper digitization? And uh, quite interestingly, you know, uh, the one that came up uh, trumps was, you know, to enhance business agility and, and, and to manage change more effectively because we've gone through that phase. And secondly, uh, it was about facilitating a seamless and secure hybrid uh, work culture, right? So I'll probably get uh, Shri here. Shri, uh, uh, you, you've been hearing Sanjeev and Prince in your organization and your, you, you represent a conglomerate which has interests across diversified areas. And, and, and I, I remember speaking to uh, earlier, you've also ha held several key initiatives within the group itself. Considering that you have a huge workforce to manage and contain, right? How 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 do you think uh, the role of digital transformation was in effectively managing such a ma big and distributed workforce? What's been your experience? You know, I think the most critical thing for any transformation really is to be able to get uh, by be it buy-in of the users, buy-in of your leadership. I think that is the most effective. Right, 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 right. Having said that, I think in the last few years, the industry 4.4 technologies are mm -hmm. really kind of taking over. We've been always talking of automation, how technology can be leveraged, etc. But I think uh, industry 4.0 is one where, you know, you're really changing or transforming the way manufacturing business primarily right, would right. be working. I mean, typically I would have said, oh yeah, somebody uh, can manually inspect something. Today, can say video analytics do inspection, can robots perform things that we would have done manually. Right. You know, can safety be enhanced by uh, technology? Uh, these are the kinds of newer applications, newer leveraging that you know technology has kind of come up with. And I think that is the area that we've been kind of focusing around. Okay. Uh, you know, talking of the points that uh, uh, COVID, non-COVID, I think we started our journey sometime a little much before, uh, say, COVID. Uh, it, it, it helped, but it did dramatically change our thought or our, uh, you know, right. roadmap, if I can say so. So, so uh, I'll, I'll open this question to all of you, uh, Shri, Sanjeev, Chris, anybody can chip in here. But do you see, uh, and uh, as you all said, you know, uh, you have your business interests spread across, you know, multiple locations, uh, uh, there are instances where you have multiple geographies also. And, and, and I'm assuming, you know, uh, you have, uh, many of you are part of, you know, manufacturing setups, right? Uh, so the, you need people at the shop floor, uh, but, uh, you know, what, what pandemic taught us, you know, you really are in a situation that you need to enable work from anywhere these days in a secure environment, right? This intact concept of anytime, anywhere work, which, which, which is, you know, what we call as hybrid work. How important has hybrid work been as one of the key business imperatives, which has led to certain digital transfer initiatives right here? Have you uh, done any and you, would you like to espouse on? Uh, as I said, open to all of, uh, maybe begin with Prince, Sajeev. I can, I can maybe share some thoughts on that. Please, please. So the, um, the hybrid work part, 
you know i just um i remember the journey when we had no choice but to declare that people work from home you stay at home and that was almost like a government mandate mm-hmm. but post that i think when it was relaxed um uh, some things have have stuck on and some things have become uh, right. more right. of a new normal and now we call it hybrid and what not but personally i don't believe in work from home i think you work from the office and you separate work at home that's a bit of a controversial thing but that's personal uh, that's a personal thing but what did what did uh, what was what was interesting for me is when you start working from home suddenly it required a a, a change in quite a few things that we didn't take so seriously before right. because if suddenly when you have the entire workforce working remotely uh, your security posture your security uh, uh, framework all the layers were suddenly exposed <laughs> so right. that was one right. where you had to really fast track projects to make sure that the known bits uh, you had a lot of things in the pipeline you were able to accelerate that and plug those in so that was one so now irrespective you know to fast forward a couple of years we probably don't have as much of work from home scenarios but we are still flexible and we have but irrespective if it's even if it's only 5% you still need to have that entire structure to be robust right right <laughs> so you you actually now moved your posture from where you were to something which is a little bit more robust now you are flexible enough to permit this uh, on demand so right. if tomorrow everybody needs to work from home you yeah, go home and but you continue working we have done a lot of things from hardware changes to device changes to everything that's in the connection points multi factor what not what not pdi all that has come in that's that's been a big enabler the other point which uh, which is interesting was when when ms sanjeev was also mentioning during this time the other change that i noticed from the workforce is there were a lot of tools that we have given you know we buy we deploy we give them licenses the usage of a lot of those uh, especially in the collaboration space used to be less than 10% and now it's way over in the high 90s so or, or, or very much there it's, i mean it's, it's almost fully utilized now that's giving you another platform to say well these people have suddenly gone to the next level of digital maturity now you are they are collaborating now you are able to give them things which they can you know they are anyway going to this single pane of activity so let's give them more stuff which they can do over there so the latency and the operational processes can be made smoother so now we are thinking along those lines where we are saying how do we get our applications the notifications to come in queues to be built people are able to just go and clear these things so that you know you don't have stuff which is left pending with people so that's another thought process that 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 uh, that that's come about because of of uh, the uh, the uh, the topic that we were just discussing okay. so, th- thanks for uh, pointing it out and uh, as you said you know uh, when we take any transformative uh, initiatives uh, i think i think uh, from a it infrastructure uh, standpoint also we've seen you seen how you know uh, our data centers have evolved you know earlier we had discrete data centers you know spread across multiple locations then you know this entire concept consolidation came in you know then came in the concept of uh, virtualization where you, you you just spoke about you know uh, utilization of it infrastructure you know we 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 see many of our fairly mission critical applications uh, working on a virtualized computer environment right uh, with, with utilization of upwards of 90 95% right and then came in the concept of uh, cloud you know cloud in various avatars you know a, a public cloud environment a private cloud environment and now which is what we see in most scenarios a uh, a uh, uh, a hybrid cloud environment right so i'll probably i'll t- take the step uh, discussion forward shri i'll bring you in uh, like i said because you do present a fairly large conglomerate right uh, we we all know and i don't know, don't want to really get into you know the, the the semantics of why is cloud good so we i think because clouds uh, been there for far too long for us to discuss that now but my question to you is like we there is a theoretical knowledge of you know why one chooses say a multi cloud environment so my 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 assumption is uh, all the three of you gentlemen here uh, run a multi cloud environment i'll come to each one of you uh, separately uh, but shri uh, what would be the key one or two reasons why you chose to go for a multi cloud environment because you know there are sort of advantages that we see in sticking on to say a single vendor the disadvantages yes but there are advantages of uh, and i'll probably request you to take it up but because every organization has their own demands and requirements 
in your view, Sri, what was the reason why you went A for a multi-cloud environment? And, and what were the details? Okay, if I if I were to kind of give a very crisp and direct response to that, it would be uh, best of breed. I went for a couple of uh, platforms, clouds. I'm able to leverage what they best offer to me, number one. Two, I think it is also a risk mitigation. I mean, instead of being stuck to some one particular and you know maybe get into flexibility issues, et cetera, uh, being able to leverage the best of each, what each one of them offers. And we had a kind of approach strategy to why I will go to A or when I will go to A and when I will go to B. Right, right. So I think th those are the two top reasons we kind of chose MLT. Helps, helps me, Shri. Uh, Sanjeev, like I said, every every uh, organization has their reasons for doing a certain thing. Uh, do you want to add to what she said? I mean, I'm, you may cho have chosen these uh, reasons. Are there any other reasons why you went for a multi-cloud environment? And probably yeah, one, of the reason, one of the reasons what we did was that basically, since a manufacturing organization and traditional manufacturing organization, we were having everything in the house. We have our own data centers and everything. Mm -hmm. I didn't think this pandemic, it was a uh, high time for us to really maintain these uh, activities up and running mm -hmm. uh, with the so many restrictions in place. So mm -hmm. what we did started working on is that let's start moving the non-critical workloads to the cloud and see how it benefits to the organization, how it really impacts on the cost and other part of it. Okay. And then we started uh, moving the chunks into the cloud uh, using the same facility on and uh, seeing how user reacts to that particular part. That was the only thing we started with and today we are using cloud for many applications uh, to have it. Okay. So this uh, anything apart from what Sanjeev and Sri mentioned that, that, that kind of <clears throat> helped you to use my yeah, I mean, no. Those are all, of course, uh, really top valid reasons. The only other reason which I had was, for me, the number of programs that we were running uh, was getting into a, a space where I wanted to try and see how we can leverage things without having to go through the process of procurement, identify, select, POC, buy, um, then learn, and then leverage. So the, there, are, there, were, there were places where you had that time to market part, which was easily addressed by a multi-cloud scenario, because right. some of those things, you know, you, you can't do everything in one cloud. You can't do some of these things are actually done in another cloud because as a partner or there's some competence that we have that can help us leverage that. Or third, because our partner or our customer or our supplier is on something, which you also need to, to, be, to be tagging on to. So for me to reduce the time to, to deliver or execute some of the programs, the easiest thing was jump onto the platforms wherever it is, irrespective of looking at, is it only on one provider or you know who's, who's got it in terms of a best of breed um, perspective. Chris, I, I hope you bring a smile to my face because like I said, uh, we, like, we ran a survey and uh, one of the points, and interesting uh, uh, that you spoke about uh, connecting with your partners, right? Uh, the reason why I say this, when, when we asked, you know, what were some of the major reasons for uh, their organization to use multiple clouds? And this was a cruise ended survey, of course. And we had uh, top five to six considerations. One big consideration, 54% of the people polled said our partner ecosystem uses application deployed in different clouds. And it's great that you mentioned that because that seemed to, I mean, if you think of it, Business drives all adoption, including cloud. So and you, you, you do not work in an environment where you're siloed, right? You work in a connected environment. So yes, you're, in a way, at times, if your partner ecosystem has a desperate set of clouds, you, you're dictated to go for that as well. So you're actually left with no choice but to go for that. Then obviously you have, you know, there, I think 51% said, you know, they get the ability to choose their cloud uh, basis, the best performance for each application. You know, you may have uh, may, maybe uh, something to do with analytics uh, runs on a particular cloud, whereas something to do with pure storage requirements, you may be doing with one hyperscale. So I think, I think as, as I can clearly see, a uh, lot of common thread between the major use cases, but there is some distinct reasons why one goes for that, right? Uh, but moving ahead, you know, uh, 
as as we all understand and you probably will know it much better than i do because you're helming affairs at your organizations you know having a cloud environment is great you know we spoke about you know the fact we want to avoid a lock in you know uh, and all of that is fine you know but we also need to understand that uh, things are like getting more complex you know uh, it's not as easy to do it as it was when we probably started our journey of public cloud or say uh, because early it was initially either a public cloud environment or maybe a private cloud environment but as things became uh, more mature we decided to you know jump in the bandwagon and see how hybrid cloud works how multi cloud works right uh, in my experience i speak to a lot of ceos as part of my job uh, that it entails what are some of the key challenges uh, that you've seen you know managing a multi cloud environment because uh, there could be many you know uh, it, the biggest challenges i have heard is uh, the basic things of you know managing the complexities of data migration or, the, or, or migrating the app itself to a public cloud from on premise server unless you are a cloud native so I, and i am sure all of three of you will have your own challenges which you have managed to mitigate or still continue to have uh like no random order she you want to take this up yeah. uh, some of the challenges yes please yeah basically i think uh, couple of challenges that come top of your mind and huh. you know if you want to talk of how well it is able to connect to your applications and one of my colleagues pointed out partners that is what how you want to see what are the security postures of each one of them how would they kind of uh, go well with your security you know uh, solutions uh, and maybe one of the things that one would want to talk of would also be the cost how well uh, how transparent are the costs i think that is where some of the billing issues would come in and you'll have surprises i think transparency of costs also is one of the challenges then maybe you know uh, one would want to kind of make sure that uh, you kind of mitigate now i think i think uh, she uh, bang on the buck you, you've been very honest about that and i'll come to the uh, element of cost because there's a question that parks specifically for that uh, sanjeev i come to you uh, what are some of the challenges that you faced managed to uh, uh, mitigate and still continue to have See the basic uh, other thing which I need to do is that you have to have the skill sets with your your teams also to right. manage the right. multi cloud right. thing because you, when you are right. talking about multi cloud things you have to see how well they are prepared to take care of that thing apart because now if it is a single cloud it is much easier to uh, get the things done but if it is multi cloud you have to see into different dashboards uh, to really see that which health system has to be uh, run at a, a high uh, bandwidth or a high uh, uh, thick utilization or things you have to scale down and scale up the things as per your agility is a important thing which is there in the cloud but if you are not able to manage those uh, agility of scaling up or scaling down right. it can right. become a havoc for you for the organization because uh, there are a lot of hidden costs which are there with the cloud environment which we generally forget to look into when we are planning for a uh, cloud so that is one thing is there then how really the cloud operators are giving you the access of their dashboards etc yes. uh, to see how exactly the things uh, gel up with your things so i think so these are the two other things which uh, mm -hmm. rather i talked about uh, that's uh, other things we'll be continuing talking about okay prince uh, you want to add in something that you... maybe a couple more snippets the thing is you know when the cloud journey started you were not spoiled for choice you know you had you worked with only one or two people yes. or one person rather and then that was where you tested your waters right now the problem is you caught too many options too many things you can do too many players out there and then different offerings and all the offerings seem to sound about the same but then you got to make some judgments about you know how are you going to make some decision on what what you're going to use from who and and why and then the other layer that comes on is uh um, you are actually adding this complexity to your environment which you need to manage at the end of the day no cloud provider is going to be responsible for uh any data or any process going wrong for the business they're only really responsible for certain parts and that's also very clear so that makes your job also quite um you know quite um tricky because you got to be really careful about everything that you are doing there you need to make sure that the 
the process, the life cycle of that is managed end to end. And uh, like uh, Sanjeev sir also said, skill set is a problem because we don't have, we can't do this all in house. So we rely on partners again uh, in certain managed service scenarios, uh, contracts, engagements that, that comes in. But we own the business process at the end of the day. And there we need to make sure that the data exchanges, the uh, security around that, that is, 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 is bulletproof. Uh, and there a lot of focus needs to be done before we turn anything on. And um, I think that is one area where we constantly keep an eye on because in this environment, the only thing that is uh, probably the most tricky now instead of interconnection is, is the security and the data privacy and the data leakage part. That's the, that's the part where I have uh, some concerns. Not that anything has gone wrong, but the thing is, it's good to be concerned about that. No, I think, I think, I think, uh, very succinctly put, because, you know, uh, the last of our exhibits that I'd like to share with all of you, you know, we, I, we also asked our, our friends who joined in today, what are some of the challenges? I think, uh, no surprises here. Uh, we've, all the three of you actually in, in some way or the other have covered that, uh, I, I think the one biggest one, and then I'll, I'll top two, I'd like to take it up further for further discussion. Because obviously when, you know, almost close to 80% people have shared with us that these are challenges they face, you know, uh, I'll probably like to take uh, some cues from you, how to manage that. So one of the big challenges uh, that, and I think that is uh, the good part, uh, the bad part, this is, managing complexity of migration you know and integration has always been a challenge even for very large organizations with very mature it systems in place you know uh, this is like i said 78 percent of our friends who were polled suggested that you know managing complexity yes i mean prince you somewhere mentioned to the problem plenty the all that exists but the basic standardization of you know migrating your legacy applications to say a cloud environment and and then, then getting it back also these are some of the challenges that they face you know uh e and somewhere i think it was she who started this very nicely said in the very beginning of our discussion that the buy in is very important now let's assume that buy in is there you know all of you represent in your own true right organizations which are very big and, 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 and established for a fairly long time. Considering the establishment is, is there for a fairly long time, I'm assuming there's a lot of legacy applications also, right? How, uh, I know, I mean, uh, I can, I could probably safely say it can never be an easy task migrating legacy applications, right? I think you've somehow touched upon uh, some of the challenges. Can I take one or two best practices from all three of you gentlemen that our friends would love to understand when migrating, say, a legacy application from your on-premise data center to a public cloud environment, what are some of the things that should be taken into account? I, uh, I'm keeping it at that because a more detailed, deep dive conversation will take hours. You need service specialists to take that. But in our, in our, uh, uh, conversation, if you could just touch upon a few points, I'll probably uh, have Sri go for, uh, at it, and then I'll probably request Prince to turn in and then Sandeep. Sure. Uh, I think, you know, we, to kind of start, we, we, we went, we moved all of our collaboration tools. We had everything one from ice, like Microsoft Exchange, et cetera. We adopted O365. Hmm. Then we kind of moved our SAP. Uh, these were a little more easy. There were legacy applications which were running individually at each of our right. units, multi-country, right. etc. So this gave us a, also a kind of vehicle, if I can say so, to standardize across my units. And when I put it on cloud, the same application getting uh, access from multi-places. So uh, I think we use this to standardize also. Okay. Okay. So same, same ways of working. Yeah, there will be 10, 15% marginal uh, differences between places, but I think this kind of uh, enhanced our standardization process and we use that to our advantage. As a best practice, I would think this will also help bringing in people together on a common platform. But uh, Sajeev, I, I'll probably uh, get your views here. You know, when we speak about legacy applications, you know, uh, 
they're, they're monolithic in nature, by and large, right? But, but a cloud environment uh, suggests otherwise, right? Uh, how, how do you think, I mean, uh, in your experience, when you migrated, and I'm sure you have done it in some capacity or other, it may be, uh, I mean, like how she mentioned, so certain collaborative applications moving on to the cloud, and you may also have eventually some fairly, uh, you know, mission critical uh, organizations, heavy uh, applications also move to a cloud environment for, for reasons which are best known to you and, 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 and respect their privacy. But uh, some challenges around that and how you manage that. Is it, is, it, is it a question of technology, people, processes? What would you uh, sing it out on? So what I would uh, simply say, Atlak over here, is that uh, when we started moving the legacy applications to the cloud, mm -hmm. the biggest challenge what we were facing is that the applications were not tested for security uh, postures tend to the thing. Because when you talk about standard applications like SAP or Oracle or any other standard thing moving out, people uh, who are developing these things have taken care of the security in a big way. But when we develop the things in-house in a legacy environment, we are just trying to create an application which runs fast, is able to give faster access to the users and able to chunk the data, whatever you're doing. But when we are moving it to a cloud where it's going to be prone to be uh, having access to anybody and can be attacked by anybody, we need to really look into it that the loopholes which are there in the application has to be plugged in fast. Mm -hmm. So what we did that we requested some security personals look into our applications before we migrated to it like the maximum possible uh, loopholes which were there, test it thoroughly in premise first of all, then move it to the cloud. So that then we have implemented CASB and all other things in, into the thing so that right. we are able to really monitor the thing that, okay, what application, who somebody is trying to get into the application through a loophole which is there into it. And you need to monitor these applications on a regular basis for any attacks or uh, something happening going to it. Because those those can create a havoc for the things because you are moving some mission critical applications onto the cloud. And today that get hacked and then your organization comes to a standstill. So there are pluses and minuses of every aspect of IT when we talk about and this is one of the uh, negative aspects that if you are centralizing everything, you need to be very full proof sure that the loopholes of security has been taken care of, and all security precautions you need to procure from the cloud partner also because most of the times it is a hidden cost in the cloud uh, journey when we talk about to any web services or a hyperscale and high he will talk about the basic part of the uh, hardware which is giving you but sometimes he misses you to tell you that if you have to get additional security that will be the initial cost coming to you second thing is then uh, the ingress and egress of the data which really need to be put into the cloud. That is a major factor right. you need to consider before you move to a cloud things because today you are talking on, on an application to be migrated, but tomorrow you have to put a lot of data into it. You have to give a big thought onto it that what all needs to be migrated to a cloud because if it is so much data pushing onto it, it's an additional cost for you because every bit which you are transferring to the a cloud is a cost. Same way, if you want to move from a uh, migration uh, from one cloud to other cloud, the, again, the egress and the egress cost is so high sometimes that you will not be able to move it from this particular guy where you are hosting the things. So all those things need to be very well documented during the migration policy you have to see. And when you're through that, okay, this is going to work from my migration, then only we should migrate to the cloud. Thank Sanjeev, thank you so much. Uh, these are great points. Prince, I saw you nodding in sort of a uh, couple of areas. I think, I think he touched upon an interesting area of security, you know, uh, right through. So, because when we talk about public cloud, we tend to talk about security, but even the fact that uh, a, 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 a legacy application is never prepared or pruned to, to, to prepare the, for the so called hardship of a public cloud environment. So, I think Sanjeev made a great point. You want to add into that? And yeah, I do. Maybe I'll take two steps back because what Sanjeev said is, is spot on on security. Yeah, and um, um, Sri also what he said is, is is actually the thought process that we follow. You know, that's 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 the generally general approach in any case. But the other part is, um, you know, why <laughs> it makes me laugh actually. Uh, we had this conversation of moving a legacy app, and I was 
my question was why are we moving a legacy app to the cloud <laughs> in the first place <laughs> what is the whole point right mm-hmm. uh, is it an app that we want to use for the next 5 years or is it something we are moving because this infrared sound is is flaky or something of that sort the, the reason for that really needs to be looked at and uh-huh. the longevity of that and the and the, and the whole uh, strategy behind that needs to be looked at because you can do it in many ways i can move this whole environment into a co-located space that's also moving to the cloud i can move the the, the software part and move it into an infrastructure as a service but that's also moving to the cloud but for me that is not exciting and i probably would not go for that unless there's any other reason which but more those can be mitigated i would look at going back to the drawing board and say what is this application doing what business process is it serving we need to actually design it ground up your application modernization has to start with you know a real application rebuild or looking at something in the market which can actually serve this purpose in in the manufacturing world there are certain applications which is tied to machines but then you wouldn't want to really make it take it to the cloud because it's it's it, it that is a legacy which you can't do much about it is localized it is it is locked in but in the other scenario i would say and and this is what we have done with one of the testing applications that we did because it we do we built a testing application for one plant we use a variation of that in another plant and this has been in 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 uh, in, in production or in our live environment for maybe about 7 years and it's about time we need to do something so the whole process was well everybody needs to access the same thing this seems to be the better version now how do we do this so the the, the whole thing was rearchitected because that was the that, that actually takes some effort but that needs investment but then you're looking at something that goes into leveraging automation integration possibility apis can be used now you can integrate it with erp and mes and the other bits you can look at how this application is is going to be managed in a ci cd manner you know you got continuous integration continuous development happening continuous deployment happening and the whole architecture is also be microservices based so you are able to use it in all plants with minor right. minor variations that to me is what i would do with a legacy app and that's how i would move it because it's about moving legacy modernizing it and moving it into your new enterprise architecture because it'll fit now i i you 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 sort of nicely it is a new enterprise architecture not necessarily everything is all cloud also yeah correct exactly exactly it's important that we recognize that fact because like you said there are certain applications which are best suited for your on premise environment and there are reasons for that yes and which is why now you see so much discussions around edge you know there there there's a reason why it exists because you can't really be in a remote cloud environment but moving on, i i i'm conscious of the time i think she initially very uh, candidly mentioned one thing and i think sanjeev touched upon it I'll, i'll probably quickly take your views on that both these element mention about as one of the challenges is managing the cost uh, tangent while you do handle the multiple cloud because let's face it when we when with that concept of cloud was sold to us you know we we one of the key tenets for cloud was pay per use you know we were moving on from a, you know capex environment to an opex environment but it is not necessarily an opex environment is equal to cheaper right that is not necessarily the case right and then you have you know multiple uh, cloud environments so do you feel you know uh, something which is not usually spoken that much about we speak about migration and all that is fine but have you seen manage you know a- a- issues around you know cost uh, as far as multi cloud goes you know be it beats your inability to track cloud spending or over provisioning you know or cloud resources or conflicting cloud strategies across teams uh, your take on this uh, she you started with this i'll probably get to you on that because i think there was a there was a great point it helped me you know given this question to you at the end okay uh let me put it like this i think no business is in the business of charity no oh, absolutely yeah so, so very very clearly quantified business outcome at what cost is what is going to be critical to getting by in Right. and so if we are saying i am going to cloud yeah we have a cloud first uh, you know policy i have a digital first policy all this is fine but at the end of the day i need to make my business profitable yeah how how can i contribute right. To right right and so we need to choose and pick where it makes business sense 
and wherever we have gone ahead and said here i'll be on cloud we need to do monitoring we need to have tools automated tools which will make sure that you know uh, have i work provision or can i bring it down there are instances when deliberately i would push it up get sure. by in, get my things run and then i would probably downscale by 50% so i think you need to kind of look at it a little more holistically uh, very clearly saying is it making business sense and obviously cost is a part of business sense she uh, i i get that and and thank you for that uh, please uh, friends quickly I, i'll probably get both your views but like i said you know uh, you know when we talk about you know your inability to track your cloud spend or your over provisioning because you know you cannot always have a foresight of how to spend or where to spend also so there are times when you earmark a large chunk you know uh, but but you, you also very cost sensitive you know because your board mandates you to do though right are there some is there a is there is there a point or two that you like to share with our friends which helps you manage a oversee your entire cloud spend and make sure you're not splurge it in a, in excess because that's something your business cannot uh, agree upon your views on that sanjeev so i would say i would simply say that what shri said is that basically you need to you need to keep the things monitoring is the biggest uh, thing which is there in the cloud uh, multi cloud environment because it's a habit of the general trend of the cios who over provision the things in the starting because yeah. of the traditional yeah. usage yeah. of in device yeah. sort of thing but once we are moving to cloud it is always a good to provision the things less than your requirement in the starting see the performance how exactly is performing then scale it up because you are not paying for the things immediately you are in case you are facing a performance based issue just scale it up and you need to monitor that whether your loads are working 24 cross 7 if not please shut down those uh, instances which are not being used into the system sometimes shutting down only the instance and keeping the operating system on is also an additional cost people sometimes shut down the application but they keep the server running that is again adding into your cost so you need to really watch and see what all exactly needs to be kept switched on 24 cross 7 what needs to be there for 8 hours a uh, usage plan the things very clearly give the responsibility to a person in the organization to monitor that particular thing work with the third party partners who can help you out give you visualization of your uh, your cloud usage have a dashboard ready with you for the multi cloud application which are available in the market so that you are able to see how your spend is happening you are able to take corrective actions into that particular part so i think so monitoring monitoring and monitoring is the only <laughs> way on the cloud which can really help you out to keep your budgets in control otherwise it could be a catastrophic thing to see that uh, you have gone into a cloud but you are not monitoring it keeping in mind oh cloud guy is going to monitor for me which is not going to happen and you will be big super time to manage so this is all i can say yeah sure prince you you want to add your two yeah to just yeah. you know what Uh, just to share a, a couple of insights from from my experience what they yeah, said uh, what sanjeev and uh, she said is, is is absolutely what we also follow monitoring is the only way to go because you don't know you haven't got a science around exactly what's going to be my usage for the coming month next right. three months so you need to really have a way to monitor that well, one thing i do though i noticed was that um with the cloud presence slowly growing now there is a focus team actually looking at that secondly on a monthly basis bills are signed off so you get to see the variation in a month on month what's happening the third one while they do some optimization steps for example one funny story uh, for optimization they turned off certain services from uh, 8 pm to 8 am mm. uh, and the next morning when they came in when they turned it back on they found that some of the service it's supposed to actually serve is not working why because mm. everything is so interconnected replication only works in the midnight in the in the middle of the night and that's the time the machine was shut down <laughs> so so you see it's 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 while 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 people try to solve one problem you could be creating other problems yeah. elsewhere so right. it, and you can and you have to go through this journey of learning and finally figuring out okay this is how i'll handle it by that time things will have changed again <laughs> so right. Right. but yeah cost is a big concern because we know for a fact that cloud journey means that it is going to be in the longer term higher cost but that higher cost has got to be with value that you can 
you can now, you need to now demonstrate. Um, and, and that becomes another onus back on the CIA. Right, right. Prince. Perfect. I think, I think, I think we're trying to do as much justice as we can, considering the time frame that we have. I have one last question before I request all of you to sign up. I know uh, it's been a great discussion. Uh, my last, and I'll probably start off with Prince here. Prince, uh, you know, you, I'm sure you've uh, got some uh, fairly specified benefits uh, out of, uh, you know, a multi-cloud environment. But is there one uh, outcome or benefit that you that you wish to achieve in NearTap, which is yet to be fulfilled in a multi-cloud investments? Any, any one thing that you can think about? Um, I don't know. I just wish would wish to have that crystal ball, which will give me a, a view into everything that's happening in the enterprise, uh, performance-wise, cost-wise, etc. So that is what I'm looking for. Uh, to me, analytics is a is a personal favorite of mine, and um, getting that part to be perfected is 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 a is a near-term target for me because it's actually bringing in sources, which is across uh, many data sets, across uh, on-prem, across clouds, across other, other sources. Getting right. that to be perfected is, is, a, is a big uh, target for me. If I can get that right, I think there's going to be tremendous value back into the organization. Thank you so much, Prince. Sanjeev, uh, the same question is to you. Yeah. Uh, so please. first of all, I would say that uh, Adoption of cloud is going to give a lot of benefits to the IT teams. Like uh, if you talk about that, you know, the nightmares of systems being down or things are everything has gone out today. The IT teams can sleep very coolly without any issues of it, that server systems going down or anything. You can get freed up for taking up other strategic jobs uh, in the IT fields to focus upon. The on the other side is that I would love to really see as a cost of the IT systems are getting down day by day. I think so the cloud cost also should keep on decreasing instead of increasing over time. And more and more tools are available to do analytics as Chris talked about, to see how we can better utilize the things. Security, important thing, we should be bundled along with the cloud things. Uh, if these things happen, I think so the utilization of cloud oh, is in time. The other important factor is the ISP connectivity. If we talk about connectivity in India, is sometimes a big issue. Until unless 5G is available in a big way in India, cloud adoption in rural areas and the far off areas where plants exist sometimes becomes a big bottleneck. So connectivity is one more important. Okay. Great, you need to be a great point of cloud interconnect as an area yeah. to invest yeah. upon. Thank you so okay. much. Uh, she very quickly, your last words, uh, one one area that you feel, I mean, I, uh, Sajiv, Sajiv and Prince, mentioned you know uh, cost optimization uh, uh, the power of analytics being embedded into every cloud investment that you do your one wish that you could you want to see in your multi cloud environment i think uh, to put it very straight would be to how can businesses become resilient using multi cloud i think that would be the thing that i would like to kind of really focus on right right thank you so much thank you so much shini shri sanjeev uh, prince been an absolute pleasure as I said, uh, you know, at times for, for, for a moderator like my, me, it becomes difficult to contain myself and not and limit my questions to these few, because I know uh, there is more to come for all our friends, but nonetheless, uh, Prince, Sanjeev, and Sri, thank you so much for your valuable time. We really appreciate it. I hope for everyone who's uh, joined in today in our uh, webinar, I'm sure they've learned a lot, they may be, uh, able to reach uh, with you directly and learn from all that we heard. Thank you so much, uh, Sri Sanjeev Prince. Been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Aplak and the team who have been running this. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you so much.